Hi everybody, uh, here I am again, and this time we're going to talk about Neptune in a way which you, you'll never have heard of before and won't ever again unless we do this. But um, the whole uh, point of doing this it, uh, is because it, it, it opens the door to the fact that there are things that we cannot see. And with Neptune, his discovery um, you know, was a real, is a real story. And I'm going to tell the story of how it was discovered. I mean, Galileo was the first person who really made a point of being, you know, reaching out into the heavens in order to find um, what he thought was a new planet. And Neptune, as we've been taught and, and, and experienced, is very elusive. I mean, you know, it, ha it rules many things, you know, uh, shifting moods, um, experiences and feelings that are uh, unique to us psychologically. It has a lot to do with, um, you know, just simply being in a state of, I would say spiritual ecstasy. There are many ways that we experience Neptune, but primarily as astrologers and when we're learning, the thing we, um, I mean, when I first began astrology, um, way back, I mean, in 1960, no, yeah, 66, 67, I had a book by Rex Bills who used to be Diana Stone's husband. Diana Stone is another old astrologer. And, she's, and um, I was trying to, you know, memorize. It's called, it was called um, Astrological Keywords, Planetary Keywords. So I have this great book, and it's got all these lists of terms for planets so that I would learn what the planet's um, basic, you know, mentality, if you will, was. And... Um, when it came to Neptune, it would say things like vague, invisible, hard to grasp, elusive. And I just went, oh, that, that's really great. Like, I, <laughs> I felt like a, that I was being sort of you know, made confused, which is very Neptunian. But literally, the Neptune list was all about obscuration and, you know, being of. You know, obscu obs you know, just completely off the off the charts when it came to visibility, and um, and it also you know he mentioned spirituality and and other things, but it really left me um, in a you know because if somebody starts to tell me something and I don't really understand it or it doesn't actually make sense, then I have to really find out what it is, and so I spent. Um, probably 40 years <laughs> learning about Neptune as it went. And I have a Neptune moon conjunction. So, you know, obviously I'm going to be terribly concerned about what Neptune is. But now I don't have a problem with it. You know, I mean, I'm older. I've been doing this for years. Uh, you know, I think I finally got a grip on Neptune about eight, ten years into my, I mean, serious grip, you know. Because the other thing that used to be difficult for me in early learning was the sixth house. And we know that's in opposition to, to the 12th, to Neptune. And, um, <clears throat> and so it seemed to me that I had an issue with body and soul. Like, you know, the soul is the 12th house and the sixth house is body. And, um, and, and we can't really say that the soul is in the body, um, though the psyche soma opposition 12th house, 6th house in astrology is about embodying, if you will, the soul. And, I mean, Socrates spent a great deal of time worrying about where the soul was and how it was and what the condition of the soul was and so forth. And so, I, I mean, everything that I've ever, you know, associated with Neptune um, or, or experienced, um, you know, in my life or, or in other studies that I've done, um, it really does talk a lot about uh, that, that you have to be extremely uh, conscious um, 
which doesn't mean that Galileo wasn't conscious when he saw it first, when he didn't know that he was looking at it. But you have to be kind of, you know, as we say today, in these days, in these crazy days, consciousness is really important. And Neptune has to do with being conscious, of being aware, um, in, in the light of obscuration. And I love this picture. Um, this is actually the very large array. It doesn't have anything to do with seeing Neptune. But it's in Socorro, New Mexico. And it's, it, it's just one of the most fantastic things that if you've never driven up from Arizona through Socorro, New Mexico, to get into, you know, Albuquerque or part of New Mexico, this is what you suddenly come upon. And it's, I went, oh, my God. And so I, this is my, one of my favorite photographs is, is this picture of the very large array, which does not have to do with sighting planets, but it is a very fabulous photograph. Okay, so um, I'm going to have to do something about the top here because I can't read my words. It's taking up everything. How do I do that? Minimize it? Uh, no. Oh, dear. Um, sorry, I can't see the top of my screen of my cover your mouse uh, over the little green part and um, you'll see like a little arrow and then you'll be able to slide it whichever way you want to. Well, it says stop share or uh -uh. I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the very large array is actually picking up um, waves radio waves it's not really about finding planets so but i do like the photograph and i thought it was a very appropriate one for this now i'm going to talk a bit about some of the technical um aspects of of galileo um in his work because galileo actually did see jupiter in 1612 late in the year, December 27, 28. And then he saw it again in January of 1613, the following year. And, um, and so Neptune is actually, you know, it's, you know, you, there's Jupiter and then there's Saturn and then there's Neptune. So it would have been the first of the outer planets that was actually uh, seen. And but what he thought, and I'll tell you why when we get there, because I don't expect you to understand this. I don't understand it. I just thought there's the sun, and these are indications of where these two bodies are that he's seeing. Uh, but he thought he was seeing a distant fixed star. Okay. All right. So this is the first time that Galileo saw Neptune. In December the 28th, 29th, um, in the night, well, actually it was rising, and the sun was, it was like close to midnight. So we were just, it doesn't matter. Galileo actually sees Jupiter, which he knows, but he doesn't know what, it, it, what he's seeing behind it. And so he was essentially seeing the unseen he himself had actually calculated that there were two bodies but it wasn't sure and the interesting part about this are the i love um charts that show the the actual positions of planets and in describing what we're looking at the moon is in Pisces. That's conjunct. Well, it's, it's close. It's in the same sign as Saturn. Moon in Pisces, and the moon is in exact opposition to Jupiter and Neptune. Now, that wouldn't have made any difference in his ability to see because he was using his own telescopes that he was the brilliant genius to have created. And Jupiter and Neptune in the heavens, as modern astrologers, we would have seen it in a square to Uranus. And but as not knowing about Uranus quite yet, um, what we are seeing is the um, uh, the confusion and the not quite understanding what it is that's going on because Galileo does see Neptune and it's exactly conjunct Jupiter, 
but he remains completely un uh, uncertain. He doesn't know, but he continues to, to look. And only 21 years later, I mean, in 1633, he was indicted and basically Galileo spends it the rest of his life in, um, in incarceration uh, in the, uh, you know, in the Catholic Church. And this is one month later. Talk, I mean, this is how we should study astrology as well as study, <laughs> look for planets, in that your persistence is always going to pay off. Even if you're confused, even if you don't know what's going on, you still persist in your study. And so another, a month later, Galileo made another sketch which shows the distance and, and the relationship between what was Jupiter and Neptune. However, he sees on, you know, like two couple months later, literally, well, actually one month later, he observes in the night sky, he sees Jupiter, but Jupiter is passing in literally in front of Neptune. And Neptune is, of course, behind it. This is extremely rare. But in this case, they're both retrograde. They're retrograde back to almost the same degree where they are, they're actually station retrograde. And I'll tell you why. Because when planets are within a, the, a gray, when the sun is in a trine opposition, two outer planets, any planet outside Mars, um, the planet begins to go retrograde. So retrograde planets aren't haphazard. It's when the sun gets to a certain degree within the trine and opposition zone to an outer planet, the outer planet stations retrograde. And it's in my book in Retrograde Planets. It gives, <laughs> I mean, I had calculated all of it because they didn't have the kind of software in, in, in 2000, or it wasn't even 2000, it would have been 1999, I guess, when I was writing Retrograde Planets. And, I, uh, and so I'm very familiar with this um, strange phenomenon that takes place. And the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction, he still thinks that it's a fixed star. And so when we move forward, to, <laughs> there, I just love that drawing of him. It's a beautiful painting. Anyway, the poor devil, there he was, you know, during the Inquisition, discovering things with a telescope. I mean, these are all totally against the Catholic uh, belief system. Anyway, we get to September the 24th of 1846, 333 years later, and Neptune is finally discovered. Now, interesting that it took not a Jupiter-Neptune conjunction, but a Saturn-Neptune conjunction. And, and although, by the way, the reason that it's, um, that these uh, outer, the discovery of, of outer planets are always distanced from the sun is because if it's closer to the sun, then you wouldn't see them, you know? So when it's night and the sun is down, as it is here, and it was in the previous charts, the visibility of the night sky is, is greater. But this is the thing that really gets me, is, is that in order to apprehend, comprehend, experience, to hold, to actually um, take part in a relationship with Neptune, within yourself, in your own horoscope, uh, it does need to be contained. Otherwise, one could disappear, go mad, um, drink too much, uh, you know, in some ways just turn into a shapeshifter, you know, become something else. And so this, this is to me one of the, when I set this chart for when it was actually cited, and it was um, discovered in 1846, as, it said, as I say, by Johann Gottfried Guy, and using calculations that were by a very, very more famous um, astro uh, astronomer, Urbain Le Verrier, and John Couch Adams. And so, it, and so 
it was in that discovery, it made it a, a, a joint British, French, German discovery because they all did work on it themselves. And so, um, it, you know, it really is very important that we understand that, you know, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And so this includes, you know, people's moods, people's, you know, the way we experience our environment, just because, you know, we can't see it or it's not manifest and people can say, oh, no, no, I didn't say that. Or, um, you know, you, you can't possibly have seen that because it was, you know, X, Y, and Z. Uh, but, but that's what Neptune's about. But it, it, be, it became important that we understood that Neptune's return to its place in, of sighting in our time, which is a 25 Aquarius, and that was with the Saturn-Neptune conjunction at 25 Aquarius. Yeah, remember that Neptune and Saturn were both in Aquarius? Okay, that happens to be the, um, the sun uh, or the moon of the United States. And so when we look at the uh, um, a situation with 25 Aquarius and Neptune actually returning to that several years ago um, to 25 Aquarius, that was the beginning um, of when we had the American situation become increasingly more untenable, the United States. And and it, you know, we, there's a great mythic uh, aspect to the epochs, the ages. Um, you know, if we think that 2,160 years is in fact precise, then we're mad because it. We don't really know, but there is a precession of the equinoxes as the Earth turns on its globe on its uh, axis, the axis actually tilts and forms um, a circle against the backdrop of the heavens. And so that every 2,600 years, um, it, will, it returns, okay? So those are called, you know, that would be called the great age. And within that, every sort of 2,100 years are the, ages themselves and so the age of aquarius is meant to be on our horizon yeah and that we're, we're probably already melding into it now psychologically and um and so if you see the discovery chart um which i'm going to go back to you'll see that it is in the sign of aquarius the discovery of neptune contained with saturn and that's symbolically because you didn't need Saturn there to, to, to see Neptune. Yeah? But, but symbolically, the containment of Neptune is very important in our personal lives, in our psychological lives, in social circumstances, in politics, in any way, shape, or form. We need containment over the dream. We need containment over the ideal so that it can be brought forth. And there's, you know, you, you, all of you are, are present and intelligent and knowledgeable enough to realize and recognize times in which you yourself have undergone a, the sort of precession of the equinoxes within yourself. In other words, where you, you know, really made a major leap forward in your experience of life or a downturn, which then, you know, is, of course, timed. So you're, you'll only have it for you know, a period of time in your life be the rest of your life but that's what we're looking at is we're looking at containment and so you know poor galileo by the way i want to recommend a really really good book and it's called galileo's daughter and it's the story because both his daughters were um in uh religious um uh, containment basically i mean they were they lived in in um in habit and and outside the world and so and he was later in his life the crime of galileo and it's in joseph campbell's book the hero with a thousand faces um it talks of campbell writes about um what happened uh, when he was uh 
you know, placed under uh, ho a house arrest in the, in the um, in the Catholic Church in in Rome, and he spent the rest of his life there. In fact, the majority of his life is spent in captivity, and there's captivity right there. Okay, and because you know he he was just such a a brilliant person and, and had so many things to offer and so many ideas and and he was forever talking yeah he was always chatting it was sort of like Socratic where he's always chatting with friends and, and you know working out ideas and very you know you know and then the mystery of course lies in the moon being moon in Scorpio and with the moon in Scorpio which is something that's kind of interesting because I'm just gonna go go back a sec to the other two charts um, the moon is in Aries when it's finally sighted. Well, I mean, when it's when he he really he really does see it. But um, and the moon is in Pisces when he sees it for the first time, Neptune. But it's the moon Saturn that is, or sorry, the Saturn Neptune that seems to me to be the most important function because we need to have some control over our our, our loose feelings. And so, um, as I've written here, you can be personally invested in the transitional points of all the epochs, but you can't, you know, you, you, you know, that, that means that you really believe that this is happening and it will be the first time ever that consciousness changes it, but that's not true. I mean, what happens is that, you know, we really don't know in in sort of or cow as it says here in real time what's going on is a kind of conscious unity that takes place in a very unconscious fashion and that leads to new archetypes all inclusive and holds a mystery so people know what's going to happen just like in the 60s i mean there are forming always radical experimentations in art music, architecture, spirituality, philosophy, psychology. I mean, these are the great archetypes of the human psyche. And, you know, in the midst of major shifts in, in the ages of, say, as they, you know, we're leaving the Pisces age, as it showed in the picture in the beginning, and moving toward the age of Aquarius. And those ages actually are about, I mean, I would say it's about 500 years of absolute chaos, yeah? As far as philosophy and metaphysics, the archetypes of, of the human psyche undergoing massive uh, change. So it appears that it, it's about 500 years that, you know, because it was only in the mid 1900s, mid 1900s that the Inquisition, it's the actual Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition was officially ended. And this was something that Joseph Campbell was fascinated with, was the fact that, that it took, you know, all those centuries to actually you know, legally end the Inquisition. And so it was a, the empire of dominance coming to a close, as I put here, marked a new version of integrated transition in which there are the arising of new archetypes. Now that doesn't mean that the, because archetype is something that isn't uh, uh, old or new, okay? But, but the arising of the vision, the ability to see and, and experience archetypal uh, life is for individuation, our personal individuation. And so it's going to be expressed, the archetype, of the new age is only going to be expressed in individual ways through you and me as people, as individuals, but also it has to have to do with um, the, the collective. And so when we uh, got to the period of Neptune's first return, which I've got up here, um, and I've got Saturn opposite Uranus, Neptune, Pluto saying, you know, this is when all hell breaks loose and all the young people get on the streets and start to really work, you know, the symbols of the 60s and they come to life. Okay, and I've done work 
you know, seminars on that for you. I mean, and, and so it's very, very, it's good news. I mean, the fact that the revolution of the old guard, you know, with the Senex and Uranus and Pluto of the heavens, Uranus, and the depths of, of, of you know, our consciousness up to the earth, Pluto, they were conversing at that time, as they are now, but when you get the opposition of Saturn to Uranus Pluto conjunction, the tension is really high. And where we are now, and we're, oops, sorry, where we were back, you know, then, is that when Neptune first returned, it returned obviously to the 25 Aquarius, where it was in its natal chart with Saturn. And it amplifies the United States collective because that's the moon of the United States of America's horoscope, 25 Aquarius. And so it has really started to come home, I think, in this country. And, and you know, there's an awful lot of people in the world, like, billions of people in the world who aren't paying any attention to the United States because they're just trying to stay alive. You know, they don't give a damn what's going on over here. Um, it's not because they, you know, they, that because they're stupid or they're mean or, or wrong. It's that they're so desperate to stay alive and keep their children uh, going and, and, and families together that they absolutely they just don't care about the news in the United States. It's very, very petty when it comes to the big collective unconscious and collective consciousness changing. And so when Neptune first returned, it, 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 it came sort of full circle from when, we, when it was first sighted. Um, we're now inundated, as I write here, ecological and environmental threat. In fact, uh, people are, I mean, this is mild, what I've written here. I mean, I wrote this quite a long time ago. But it, it woke at the sighting in 1846. When Neptune was sighted, the invisible became visible. We got to, to see the, the smog. We got to see the difficulties of the earth, that we got to actually realize the problem of transmigration. We've really come full circle. I mean, I mean, right now we're essentially at the half cycle of Pluto, which is another very significant planet, you know, in our evolutionary way. And it was cited February 18, 1930, and that's 245 years for it to go around the ecliptic, uh, and it's very long because of it has a, a very um, high 17 degree orbital inclination. And it therefore takes um, 11 years to pass through Scorpio. But I'm very glad for that because I have like three bodies in Scorpio, including my ascendant and three planets in Leo. So I thought, oh God, no, please don't let this be any longer. 12 years is long enough. But by the time we get into Taurus, it'll be 32 years transiting the sign of Taurus. So Pluto is quite significant in, in our collective unconscious. And that's where, ne and I'm bringing Neptune into this because we have to recognize that it's Uranus and Neptune and Pluto. But this is focusing on Pluto and we'll go further. So we can't really blame planets or even on on people it, it, it it's very you know i'm pondering it still like what is it that really makes an epochal shift what happens and we can look back over time um you know i was it was funny or not funny but i mean i was talking to my um elder daughter in at the swimming yesterday when we go because we go swimming monday wednesday friday and um I said to her, uh, you know, it's, it, it's really strange how all of this, you know, the, you know, what's taking place as far as environmental and archetypal, you know, alterations in the society, how in our world, in, on the globe, on the planet Earth. And I said, but, but when we look back, 
you know, and I'm being facetious here, but one day there was like 5,000 um, Neanderthals in the south of France. And then a week later, there weren't any. Yeah. So there's, there's something about, you know, the evolution of the planet, that's our planet, Earth, that doesn't have anything to do with, with transits. It just is what it is. And, and, you know, what we have to deal with, of course, is the consciousness that we have. Now, there's, there, ha, there is now, whereas there didn't used to be in the days of the cave dwellers and the, and the earth people, um, there never was a, a, a separation or a distinction between nature and culture. Whereas now, I mean, I mean I've been talking about this for several decades, that there is a Cartesian split between nature and culture, between human knowledge and its stupidity. And so all of this is coming to a critical turning point. And the answer in, lies in the question, what can I do about these wonderful and terrible things? And so there's, there's a beautiful sculpture of, of, of Neptune, of Poseidon with his trident. And um, as it says, where I, where I can't see, oh yeah, it takes 164.79 years to complete a single revolution around the sun. And so I just put in these symbols just to illustrate. The interesting thing about Neptune is, you know, I talk about the other planets, and I, I always like to mention and make it clear that the, the other planets of Uranus and, and uh, sorry, yeah, let's say um, Uranus and Poseidon and Hades, they weren't bad guys. They just had to divvy up you know, the portions of, of existence, you know, earth, sky, air, water. And so they drew straws. They, and the, the, the short straw was drawn by Hades, who got sent to the underworld. And uh, Jupiter, Zeus, got the skies, so he had loads of fun, lots of women. And Neptune was, was pretty prolific himself. But Poseidon drew the seas, and he drew the seas, um, which it have been depicted in art as like horses crashing onto the waves. So he grew up onto the shores in the waves. So, but the, it's the trident, and this is a big misconception in astrology. Um, the trident is what uh, Neptune or Poseidon would hit the earth with, and it would cause a tsunami because it, was the result of an earthquake. So Neptune rules earthquakes, not Uranus at all. Let's see what's next. All right. Well, there's loads of ways of taking in Neptune if we're seeking the gods within. I mean, Neptune is, you know, about our capacity to um, experience altered states of consciousness. And that's one way. Um, and it can be taken in through, uh, through the natural methods of the um, Incans, uh, people who are in, you know, um, Machu Picchu. Here's a picture of a fellow looking at beautiful hats. I, I've been there. And, uh, you know, ingesting and eating, if you will, the earth and it becoming Antheos, in other words, the god within. Antheos is to eat the god and have it within you. Uh, there's, you know, nothing to say about indigenous peoples, you know, having their rituals, because these were all God-given gifts. These weren't just sort of, you know, let's shoot up some heroin or something like that. This was about a spiritual movement. Then, um, Coke was used, Coca-Cola, uh, cocaine was put into Coca-Cola in the beginning. And then people started smoking uh, yeah, cocaine tooth drops. I put that, I love that. And here's a bunch of people, I guess, uh, haven't been smoking opium. And here's some cocaine, in case you ever haven't seen one, pile of it. And, and that was in 1855, it was seen. And, um, uh, Freud was particularly interested in cocaine because when he first tried it, because this was back in his day, 
When he first tried it, he wrote to his friend Fleiss and said, I have found the perfect drug. You can stay up for weeks, think constantly, and write entire volumes of books. And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> this guy was really in trouble. And, you know, in fact, he did have a terrible addiction to cocaine. But the cocaine was about changing the consciousness. Okay, so we're seeking the God, the high, yeah, when we're looking into Neptune as a dangerous possibility, okay? Now, as far as pit marijuana goes, you know, we all know now that, you know, it, that it's legal, basically. I mean, for years and years, people have, you know, there was a time when it was legal and then because nobody knew really what it was, was and then there was a time when it wasn't legal. And now people are able to get, but look at this, helping people get over their problems easily since the dawn of time, illegal since 1906 for doubtful reasons. Well, it's, it's legal in many parts. I mean, many parts of the world, then nobody cares. Yeah, but it's in the United States and in the Western world where we have these real concerns about drug addiction, which we should have. Yeah, we want to watch out for that for, with our children and so on. And um, but the the whole function of 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 you know the the gift from the gods because the coca leaf was given to the Incans. Because they were hungry, they were exhausted, they had no, you know, they just couldn't go on. And so that God was so sad that he cried and he, he, he cried tears that from the ground up sprang these plants that were to be taken and eaten in order to be able to sustain energy and consciousness, you know, because it had to do with consciousness. Because, you know, whenever tasks were undertaken by, you know, earlier cultures, then ours, they were always taken in the name of the gods or a god or a goddess that was embarked in the same path that they were on. And so, you know, when you think in terms of, of the negative side of Neptune, um, it has got some very dangerous side effects including you know people who are um clinically unwell who's who are mentally unwell who have issues with clarity in their mind and and neptune does rule madness on that level i don't like to use those words because they actually sound really judgmental but the fact is, is that there are people who are very ill mentally. We know that. And it is about Neptune you know, essentially confusing the mind. Now, other aspects of Neptune are even more right now. Um, what was interesting about this is that in uh, 1859, um, two fellows struck oil for the first time. And it was 13 years after 1859, 13 years after Neptune was sighted. And um, have you ever seen a, a book that's, or a book, a, a movie that's very hard, but it's called um, Blood. Uh, there Will Be Blood. It's got Daniel Day Lewis as a, as a person who discovers Neptune or discovers um, oil on his land. It's a movie worth watching. It's really good because it covers all aspects of Neptune. I was in Kuwait long, a couple of years after the fires that had gone, had been since the Saddam had invaded Kuwait. And uh, that was really terrible. And then we have all these terrible things like beach close, you know, to oil spill. There will be blood, Daniel Lady Lewis, really worth seeing. This is just silly. You know, I just put funny stuff here because, you know, we're really talking about environmental issues when we think in terms of the degradation of, of, of spirituality because the spirit is no longer um, so much a part of the world 
in the sense of how we look at it so that even um, before Neptune was sighted, obviously the archetypes uh, would have been there and remained in a sense in utero until it was time for its birthing. And so when Neptune was sighted, what we ended up having was, um, you know, all the things that I've just been talking about, the shapes and the agencies that sort of cling to the Neptunian archetype can move over to the sort of Jupiter Dionysian ritual of wild women drinking and using the wine and the vine to take in the god and theos. It's very interesting because you, you, you all know, of course, that before Neptune was sighted, Jupiter ruled Pisces. Oh, sorry, uh, Neptune ruled Pisces um, and, and Jupiter ruled Sagittarius. No. Sorry, got confused. Ah, I, I just got overtaken by Neptune. Um, before Neptune was sighted, Jupiter ruled both Sagittarius and Pisces. And um, there have been three outer planets, and they've each usurped in their own time um, what seemed to be very appropriate signs. And so with Neptune and Jupiter together in the sighting charts, it even further convinces me that there is still a symbiotic relationship um, in the uh, personal unconscious and in our, our collective unconscious. And that, you know, for all of us to, you know, see the spirituality to be part of taking in the God and filling the soul with the richness of the full void, because in Neptune is the full void of the Gnostics, which is was part of Jung's studies and his work, which is a place that exists, you know, in that all elements of creation and creativity and constellate at significant times in gestation and birth. So that when something is suddenly discovered, discovered, uncovered, it has a lot to do with it being possibly obscured by Neptune until something like Jupiter comes along or Saturn comes along, um, as Saturn and Neptune were conjunct, remember, at 25 Aquarius when that was cited. So that when we get a, a, you know, a, a good, strong, healthy Saturn, we'll often be able to put embody, yeah, embody, literally, uh, our, our ideas. And ideas are really kind of dangerous because we don't really have a way of, of uh, containing them um, except through, uh, you know, dogma, yeah. As a, and dogma has a lot to do with, you know, the idea that, that what we're looking at here is, you know, um, a way of absolutely sealing the fates of an idea. Because anoia, eat where I've written here, anoia, which is idea, prologos, the word, represents the feminine of the spirit of creation. And that's something that has lost, been lost in our, our civilization, our current civilization, if you will, a long, long, long ago, yeah? So the emblem for primordial infused kind of participation mystique, French way of saying, where we are, you know, at one with the universe, a pre-conscious kind of state of mind, you know, the desire to go into oceanic, ecstatic, which means literally to stand outside yourself, as I've written here. We need to have these um, rituals, but they, you know, become uh, kind of bastardized in, 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 in addiction, drug addiction. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I think that there's so many of us that, that really, really truly love you know the mystical and the universal experience and the ideas of the of the gods and and change and transformation and then it, it really wasn't though until neptune was sighted that this longing for the lost entheos the lost god within actually became what we now have in some cases, addictions and dark forces.
and the, of course, desire to be oblivious. I mean, it's, it's quite understandable. But it's also the desire to find the divine within the self. Does anybody have any questions about what I was, what I've just talked about? We should turn on our mics, I think, at this stage. I can't do anything because I have no, I don't have the screen. Erin, what would you say with um, somebody, say about somebody who has Neptune on their ascendant? Oh, um, interesting. Uh, uh, Michael Bartlett, who's going to be one of your speakers, he just finished a book called The Map, called Mavericks. I mean, he's just published it. And it's all about having planets on ascendant, descendant, and I see in midheaven on the angles. But Neptune on the ascendant, I would I would talk to the person who I was who who has it. I would talk to them and say, you know, you must have been, you know, a there might have been a problem when you were being birthed, yeah. And I, my brother has Neptune on the ascendant. He was born with it. His mother, when she was delivering him, was given a a, a, a drug that actually caused her to go mad. And so she was like having, it was a horrible situation. And, you know, um, and so that when you have Neptune, you know, involved in anything like rising, which was his birth chart, right? So while she's giving birth, she's like screaming at the doctor and going crazy because they'd given her this particular kind of drug that was supposed to help. Yeah. The contractions. And, um, so I think that Neptune on the Ascendant is someone who is seeking always the ideal. It's absolutely essential that that individual experience, you know, uh, transformation, reformation, spiritual movement within their soul, heart, or in their mind even. I mean, you know, spirituality isn't just an invisible vague force that takes place. It can actually manifest, you know, in, in the ideal world. I mean, somebody that had Neptune on the ascendant, I would tell them that, you know, well, this planet can do two things. It can obscure your, your way of looking at life, um, or it can actually enhance your way of experiencing life. A big difference. Thanks, Erin. That's a great answer. Any more questions? Yes, I have one. Hi, Erin. Hello, how are you? I'm good yourself. You look lovely. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, oh, oh, it's personal. I have uh, Neptune conjunct my son in Libra in the sixth house, but do you have anything to say just about Neptune conjunct the sun, period? <laughs> Well, I have Neptune conjunct the moon, or in proper language, it's moon conjunct Neptune, because uh, it's the faster moving planet. Um, right. It's it says that on one hand, there's a there's a, a kind of weakness of the body with Sun Neptune, and a more, um, much more vulnerable, let's say, to environmental influences, and so that um, you would really need to be very very conscious of how to maintain your health but also very conscious about who's invading your soul like the kinds of people that you're that are around you it's very important with sun neptune or moon neptune to be with a tribe that is you know really um really giving you energy as opposed to draining you because neptune can really drain you i mean you know it, it doesn't do it in in magical ways it just you know is a time when Sun Neptune people or Moon Neptune people are, you know, they just get very tired, you know, when they're over inundated with people. And so they have to, you know, spend great deals of time alone. And that's really, a, I think, a very healthy thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, it also means that you're, you're more vulnerable, yeah, to, uh, to, you know, whatever it is that's going around, whether it's an idea or, or the flu. And so, you know, you need to be very conscious that your mm -hmm. sensitivity isn't neurotic. It is what it is. And, you know, try not to turn away from people and everything, yeah, just because of it. Because 
it's it, it isn't it isn't it's not a bad aspect but it means that you do need to be careful of who you hang out with and, and that you need to also spend time with really good people it's very important thank you that's that's what i've lived and it it's very helpful to have that affirmed oh i'm i'm glad thank you yeah Anybody else have any uh, anything they want to add or comment on? I had a question. Um, what if you have uh, planets that are right at that the uh, discovery? You know, where Neptune was at twenty five Aquarius. For, oh, for people who have planets that will be conjunct that point. Well, that would mean that, oh dear, I'd have to go back and look at my ephemeris. Um, when, okay, sorry, can you repeat that in a different way? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. Okay, I guess what I'm wondering is, um, is the Neptune, maybe the Neptune energy um, enhanced in people who have planets at the Neptune discovery um, degree, which is that 25 Aquarius? You know, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, a good question. There is no, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's only stupid answers, which is why I have to be careful <laughs> that I don't give the wrong <laughs> the stupid answer. But I think that there has to be some archetypal connection. The thing that's most dominant in my mind when you ask me this is that it is the degree of the United States' moon. And so being in the United States and an American, then I think that there would be a much more sensitive response than to many people to what is going on in the country politically, if that makes any sense. But you would also have to be very aware that you pick up from other people um, things that are really important that you be able to segregate or isolate to make sure that they're healthy things that you pick up, attitudes, ideas, energy, yeah? So you're really sensitive to the archetypal energy at 25 Aquarius, Neptune, um, who became visible, so to speak, in fact, was through the telescope, uh, but was invisible, but no, but knew, but was there for like 333 years. So I think that if you have a Sun, Neptune, Moon, Neptune, Venus, Neptune, um, Mercury, Neptune, the inner planet, especially, that it's very important that you that you make sure that you're taking in healthy information, yeah, like. Because ideas are, are like food. If they're bad, they can make you sick. Yeah. So have you noticed that in yourself? Most definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I have been I have been as an Aquarius right there at twenty five uh twenty five Aquarius and that triggers um I have a I guess you could almost call it a grand square with the, the nodes oh. and the moon uh Venus opposition with Neptune. <laughs> so Oh, 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 okay. Well, then, yes, it will. I mean, you know, it's almost like I just finished reading your entire chart because uh, <laughs> as opposed to answering a single question. Yeah, you, you are a very, a very vulnerable person to negative impact. And, and, you know, it doesn't mean that you're a victim. Yeah, and other people can, you know, say, oh, you lost, they get the, the divorce things. It's not true. You're just conscious. Yeah. I, I do pick up on a lot of stuff um, that people don't see, and it's yeah. very frustrating um, until it actually comes out, and then I'm kind of like, duh. <laughs> you know? I totally empathize. I mean, I have Moon Neptune in the 11th, and it's very, you know, groups, organizations, and, and, and tribalism, and, you know, my, my longing for, you know, the great, great family is very deep. And so, you know, one can be quite easily wounded with that vulnerability. So there on the surface, yeah. So you, yeah, you're right. 
Has anybody okay. else a question? Oh, you're very welcome. Erin, what about the shadow side of Neptune? Um, I'm sure you've heard of Typhon, the Greek myth, with um, who had many snake heads. You heard of that? Like M Medusa or Typhon? Uh, Typhon, T Y P H O N. Yeah, the Greek. Yeah, you know, I don't know a lot about Typhon, um, but I, because it wasn't one of the archetypes I was picking up on, but. Um, Right. Um, doesn't have a whole lot to do with like uh, going crazy and like a tornado. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I, well, it, yeah. right, let me say that I, I won't address Typhon because I don't know enough about it. Okay. What about the shadow side of Neptune? The shadow side of Neptune is is like I described. Um, you know, the the desire to take the god, uh, god goddess within. Um, in the form of some form of drug uh, or alcohol or, you know, which doesn't mean that you can't have a drink or that you can't smoke a joint. I mean, this is it's not about that. It's about obliterating the self. I mean, Neptune can be both obliterating and enlightening. And that's where I think the uh, division between consciousness and unconsciousness comes in. And so I think that, that Neptune's archetype really is all the things that Rex Bill said in his book. Vague, uh, you know, uh, amorphous, um, we can't really get a grip on it. Um, and so, you know, but it's very creative. It's very artistic. It's associated with the arts. And with things that, that like, for example, well, here's an example, film. In the old days, when I was a kid, we had projectors that projected film against the wall or on a screen. Now, you couldn't see the, if you just projected it out into the outside, you'd never see the, the picture inside the screen, inside the camera. So the screen is the projection. And so people with Neptune, uh, strongly implicated in their horoscope can become screens for other people's projections so that they can internalize the projection, negative or otherwise. Look at uh, Jane Mans or um, Marilyn Monroe. I mean, her, her she was projected on so badly that it killed her. She, you know, took drugs and died. And I mean, that is introjecting the projection. So if somebody was projecting on me, for example, as being, um, you know, exceptionally astute or brilliant or whatever, um, even if it was right, it would still be a projection. If I introjected it, that could make my ego become more a porous. Yeah. So I wouldn't be as strong emotionally because I would have interjected it, which is one of the things that Jung was big on, was do not introject other people's projections on you and try not to project yourself onto other people. But people with Neptune, strong Neptunes, are, I mean, I know a very, very, very famous astrologer with Neptune in the mid in the 10th house. And, and that, that person is, you know, considered, is nothing but a projection. Because nobody ever sees who sees her, <laughs> and so I mean, it just shows you that you could be a victim of other people's vision of you, or what they want you to be, or something that they have inside themselves, but they project out onto you. Or you can become a real hero with ideals that you can you know, you can save people, you can you know be a you know, a helper a very useful person in society. You can have great ideas that help change people's lives. It's, it, it, it has um, a shape-shifting characteristic to it, Neptune. It, essentially, it, it, you shouldn't trust it. Um, you need to trust the way you experience things and, and you know, look at it that way. Thanks, Erin. Um, that's great. Um... So projecting idealized images onto the Neptune person, it seems to me the experience that I've had with people like that is that 
these idealised images cannot seem to stop because you go from one to the other to the other. It just, you know. How know. do we get to the reality of that person? Would it be through the Virgo archetype? Well, I think that's where um, planet, like the signs are, are beautifully arranged because they're opposite to the, the container. And so Virgo is like the container of the Neptune, yeah, of the Pisces. And so that Mercury, double, double god, he's both trickster and teacher, and he's also psychopompous, soul guide. There's a, a 12th house comment. But we look at Mercury and, and, the, and Virgo as being places where it's very tangible. We look at the 12th house in Pisces and Neptune as things that are intangible. And, you know, I have a, this moon, Neptune, in the 11th. I have been projected on, and many times. Sometimes it's been lovely, and I, I mean, I've, I've had to say, no, it's not really that. I'm not that, really. Um, but uh, and other people have projected upon me demonic forces, <laughs> which I have paid for dearly by not realizing that that's exactly what the person was doing. No, yeah. no, it happens. Um, so, yes, you have to watch out for uh, who you think you are and who other people think you are. Mm, well, I'm the one who has Neptune on the Ascendant. Oh. <laughs> and um, I refer to myself as a psychic vacuum cleaner because it's Neptune's in Scorpio. Oh. What could you tell us about Neptune in Scorpio? <laughs> oh, well, I would say that, you know, that, that when Neptune was transiting Scorpio and, and does so every 114 years, I think, uh, it, and it's there for like 14 years, that it picks up all the, the garbage and then it begins to dispense it in different ways. It can cleanse as well the darkness. It can cleanse the garbage of the collective or, you know, it can, you know, it can offer up, you know, a solution, Neptune, solutio, to dissolve can offer a solution to a problem. Um, yeah, so when you have Neptune in Scorpio, which is, a, you know, 14 years, pretty much of a generation, okay? Part of a good part of a generation of, of people. Um, I remember writing about it when I was writing um, uh, uh, about families and, and Neptune and, and in Pisces. Is it the tendency for the person with Neptune in Pisces but it can't be just that alone, okay? But, but, but the tendency is to be able to look through into the dark side and see things without being afraid, yeah? So there's a lot of um, uh, ideas that come to my mind, like becoming a psychotherapist or, you know, becoming a healer of really dreadful things in physiology, for example, as a doctor. Um, becoming an astrologer so that you can look into, you know, the unknown. Uh, there's just, you know, so many important functions to both the sign, Scorpio, the invisible and the, the sort of hidden one, and Neptune. And so when Neptune went through Scorpio and loads of people were born, you know, they came, the boy I described, that, that my, I mentioned my brother, he had Neptune on his ascendant in Scorpio. And his mother was given this uh, drug when he was being born. And he now actually is the uh, head of a, a legal a medical marijuana center. So, it, you know, it's, it's all about drugs and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and vision, yeah? Which is what the Dionysians did which are Jupiterian, but they're also Neptunian, the women who go out and drink of the vine, as they said in Greece, and, and have these visions. And so the visionary is, is very present with Neptune and Scorpio. Thank you so much. Um, I have one final question, and if anyone else has a question, please do unmute. Um, how, to, how to release this garbage that one has absorbed you know, the Neptune person has absorbed from others or their environment, how to release it? You know, that is really a huge, that's a really big, good question and a big question. Um, I think by 
polarization, in other words, flipping to the opposite, where the Scorpio is the, you know, the harbinger and the holder of the darker forces, which aren't all bad, and flipping it over into the Taurus function, where you're, where it's really about, you know, applying your information, your knowledge of, of working with people to help other people solidly, help them. Yeah, of of giving to other people, and 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 that will help um, assuage the 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 soreness, the sadness that comes when people project dark onto you. Yeah, because it's very it's very sad. You feel very lonely if that happens, and and the the best way around the the function of Scorpio and that's if it's negative is to go into the Taurus mode of, of being useful, feeding people, looking after them, uh, doing volunteer work. Uh, I mean, what you're doing, for example, is exactly what Neptune on the Ascendant in Scorpio is, is that you're actually facilitating vis visuals, you know, um, computer work and, and movies uh, for volunteering uh, for the sake of, of uh, you know, astrology especially in an evolutionary sense now do you see what i mean I'm using oh yes, oh, yes. You know, I, I love just, the way you say it <laughs> <laughs> you know so i mean thank you very much for 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 projecting it that way yeah <laughs> oh it's real you you really are amazing and we love you so much and <laughs> okay so look any final questions from our audience It's okay if you're all just sitting there stunned. There. <laughs> <laughs> I did have oh, great. a question. Unless someone else had one. No, hurry up. Oh, Go okay. ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm looking at <laughs> I'm looking at a lot of the deception um, uh -huh. that has uh, occurred over time uh, with the Neptune ar archetype under the guise of um, this is helping a great number of people when in actual reality it's um, stealing um, the resources of others and the earth and you know all of that so I know how, how do we uh, I don't know how do we rise above that because you know I, I listened to the the answer that you just gave um, Linda as far as helping other people, but a lot of these problems, the the help that has to come, is coming about because of these problems created via this deception. <laughs> so it's an endless loop. It's 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 like an infinity symbol. You know? Yes, or a yeah. Mobius strip because. Yeah. If you're walking around in a Mobius strip, you're always all in the outsider, you know, whether it's the inside or the outside. Um, this is a huge philosophical and very practical question because it involves um, whole eras of time and what has come of the uh, collective consciousness uh, via... Um, well, media and also via a misinformation and also through anxiety because the collective anxiety is so high that people that who are, are, are weak or who are you know dangerous or mentally ill or you know because mentally ill people aren't dangerous or weak they just are you know they just have to pick up they pick up too much. But anyway, these people are the ones who seem to be uh, the ones that are able to carry the, the banner. Um, I mean, discounting people like the Dalai Lama and so on. Um, there are a lot of people that are in power right now in every country, every country in the world, who are in fact projecting their darkness onto the people who are then interjecting it and taking it on which means like in the United States, the Mexican border is one of, is exactly what you're describing. The Mexican border is what you're describing. Like, and what's, 
you know, that's just part of it because that goes on everywhere in the world. It's just, it's not expected in North America. Yeah. Or, 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 or Europe, collective Europe, or even in India. I mean, there's, there's a million countries that wouldn't even dream of doing what's going on in this particular country that we're in now. I'm in. Okay. And so I think that that's part of the darker side of the projection of, of Neptune. Because if a projection isn't something you do consciously. You don't know you're doing it necessarily. You do not know you're doing it, in fact. Thank you. What do you think, Ms. Wanda? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, it's. I uh, was also looking at um, a lot of the um, things going on, not just here, but um, throughout the world where... Um, certain countries have um, immersed themselves into another country's affairs and overthrown their government under the guise of, we know what's best for you. Of and course. Then, um, yeah. I mean, some of us had mothers that said that. I, I mean, you can't believe everything. And the fact is, is that when you think of all the people floating around in boats, you know, uh, on the seas, if you will, of Neptune's darkness uh, as a result of the illusion of power that has been interjected by the leaders. And so, you know, it, it, it's one of the most difficult periods of time to actually discuss, you know, in brief because of it, it really demands of a kind of a round table discussion where we could all sit and say, well, this is what I've seen, this is what I've, and you know, try and figure out what and hell is going on um because i i actually don't know what's going on i i can see what's going on but i don't know what that is what it's going to lead to yeah 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 so So just just try try and do the best you can with what you've got i mean that's my only my only hope for me is to be able to do that and if you blow it apologize if you're, you know, angry, try to take it back. Uh, you know, it's, it's really an important emotion. These things like anger and, you know, sadness. And these are all very important human experiences. But to the degree that we're experiencing the anxiety now, I'm not real sure. Neptune does have to do with uncertainty and anxiety. Yeah. And um, so that's what we are. We are right in the middle of it at the stage. It's an evolutionary turning point. Okay, Erin, I'd like to thank you so much for a brilliant meeting. Thank you. Yes, and we're looking forward to having you back. Can't wait for that. And um, I'm just going to unmute everyone to say thank you to Erin Sullivan, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Louisa, thank you. Oh. <laughs> the other day. Thank you, Erin. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. There you are, Cassia. Oh, nice. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. <laughs> you being on, that's amazing. There you are. <laughs> My video. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. Bye. Right. Bye. See you all Bye. later. Thank you, Erin. Yeah. Thank you so much.